Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, and I'm very excited about having this really special guest. Now, folks, I just want to let you know, you know, I've had some of the top, I've had Pentecostals come on my program. I've had atheists come on my program. Lutherans come on my program. Evangelicals, a ton of evangelicals. A lot of people from different perspectives. And uh, for a long time, I've been like, I really need to get Catholic voices on my program. And uh, this is actually my foray. Uh, this has really been a great opportunity to bring on somebody who is of the Catholic tradition, but has an interesting story about how he got there. In one sense, he got there from the Susquehanna to the Tiber, uh, which is a very interesting, we're going to be talking about this book. Um, and it's just, it's interesting because I just want people, you know, for those of you, many of you are very faithful uh, LDS folk. And, uh, you know, of course, you sometimes don't like to hear deconversion stories or people coming down into different faiths. But I think you're going to find Jeremy to be very thoughtful and I think if you if you, just to hear his journey to Catholicism, which is fascinating, and I'll have you know, folks, there's a time I was flirting with Catholicism myself. So I get where Jeremy got or where he got, why, how, how he ended up where he got was because I was heading in that direction at some point in my life as well. So without further ado, Jeremy Christensen, author of the book From the Susquehanna to the Tiber, A Memoir of Conversion from Mormonism to the Roman Catholic Church by Ignatius Press. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Stephen. I'm happy to be here. And I want to thank Andrea Boring for helping uh, put this together. She is with Ignatius Press. And just so you know, folks, I just want you to know Ignatius Press is, uh, because it's probably not too well known to uh, the LDS audience, it's a very influential, very important uh, Catholic publisher here in North America. Um, I've read many, many, many of their books. I have friends uh, who uh, have uh, have or traditional Catholics or conservative Catholics who read the, love the, the books as uh, the, the publisher as well. So I'm very familiar with Ignatius. And I think this will lead to a relationship where I will, I've asked them to send me Catholic theologians who may have engaged Mormonism, because I want to hear a Catholic perspective on Mormonism, which we're going to get a little bit of that today as well. So with uh, Jeremy, I'm so excited about this because, you know, I just finished this book yesterday and I found it to be a well-written book. But before we talk about the book, and actually, I just want you to give a little bit of your background. You come from small town Utah. Uh, maybe just talk a little bit about Growing up in a small town in Utah, in a very, very Mormon community, and how much of an impact Mormonism had on your uh, growing up as a child? Yeah, so I'm from, like you said, a very small town, still small, called Blanding, Utah. <clears throat> it's in the Four Corners area. So the closest kind of known place is, is generally Moab, Utah, where Arches is. It's about an hour and 15 minutes further south of Moab. Uh, 3,000 people, give or take. Um, so, so pretty small. And at least when I, I don't know what the, what the demographics are exactly now, but when I was growing up, it had to have been at least 80% Mormon, at least nominally, but growing up in, you know, the, the early nineties through the nineties, very active, right? Like our, our meeting house was packed. There were two, there were two stakes. When I was growing up, our town had two stakes in it. And Mormonism was, you know, everything. It was just that that's that was how we live. My parents were and still are very faithful. They're serving their second mission right now. Uh, they took religion very seriously and not in like a fanatical weird way it's just like in a normal a normal way and um you know we said family prayers every morning and every night we read from the from the book of mormon every morning that's how i learned to read was reading the book of mormon and we went to church every sunday my parents always had callings my parents even through times where we had a lot of financial difficulty through some, some years when I was young, you know, my parents were absolute faithful tithe payers. Um, just sort of, I think everything that the LDS church envisions uh, an active family being um, they had seven children and my, my dad was a Bishop for a while when I was young and it was just part of our life. We went to, you know, activities on i forget if it was tuesdays or wednesdays i know it changed at some point um when i was growing up from tuesdays to when wednesdays you know we had mutual uh and was active in boy scouts and like pretty much everybody i knew was lds like almost everybody i think i recount in the book 
one evangelical Protestant kid that I Ooh. harassed when I was in first grade. I had no idea what, what an evangelical Protestant was. Um, this poor kid. Uh, but like, I, I literally, I knew one, one, and then there was a, a family we were close to that lived in the town that were some form of Christianity. I, I don't know still to this day, but you know, I, I just want to, uh, cause you actually talked about two interactions you had with evangelicals in the book and you feel in one of them you feel bad about to this day i, I since this is the convergence of our worlds let's talk about that first the story about a kid giving you a cross and then a, another incident that happened that you really regret sure yeah so the first one is um the uh close friends of ours the sanders family they they were some species of christianity i, I don't don't really know and one of them who was about my age paul uh gave me a cross one time just about yay big it was not a crucifix it was just sort of in my in, i remember it being kind of a a bronze cross just simple cross and in my mind at that like we spent our time you know playing in, in the canal uh it's a rural area played outside a lot and to me it was it was like in my imagination the cross of coronado from indiana jones in the last crusade i was like oh this is awesome now i can I can play this even better now. Uh, and, you know, when I brought it home, my parents told me I had to give it back and, and, and sort of explained to me, you know, we don't wear crosses. We don't have crosses in our house and, and sort of set that out. And, and so there was this sort of discomfort um, uh, with, with the cross. And I remember being confused about that, but not, you know, it wasn't like it was a, a monumental thing, but th that was sort of one interaction. Uh, the other was when I was in first grade, there was a kid named Samuel uh, who moved into our town and lived down the street. And he was, ha had a really sick, uh, thick Southern accent and was evangelical Protestant, um, I'm sure, just just from how he spoke and, and talked. And I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what a Baptist was. I think he was Baptist. Um, and me and a friend started picking on him. We were chasing him around the neighborhood to beat him up. And one of my neighbors, who was a couple years older and is a, a huge kid named John Hughes, um, we were just about to punch this kid. And I feel somebody like grab me and, you know, pull me off and scold me and, and uh, tell me what a horrible thing it was to discriminate against people like that. And I didn't really know what that meant, but, um, but I, I, it's definitely something I just felt later on in life. And to this day, you know, really awful about, because here's this, here's this kid who moves into this community that is overwhelmingly LDS and is picked on because of his because of his faith and i say this in the book you know my parents never taught me to act that way i, I don't i don't it's probably just sort of inherent human fallenness tribalness right of us and them kind of behavior but those were you know those were really my early interactions with christianity there was in our scout troop uh, another kid named um oh gosh i can't remember his name now he he moved into our town and he was Catholic. There's a there's not a Catholic church in Blanding. There is a small Catholic mission church in Monticello, about 20 minutes north. Uh, but he, you know, we never talked about religion or anything. He came to scouts. We had a huge scout troop, like 20 something kids. And um, th those were really my interactions with with Christianity, other than kind of the vague sense that you get growing up. Mormon that we belong to the restored church and that we have the fullness of the truth and um and that we're different mm -hmm. than other you know religions that that talk about following Jesus. You know one of the most interesting things, you know, growing up, you grew up in the era of Ezra Taft Benson and his really he really, really pushed the idea of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what uh, caused your parents to really have you guys delve into it because this is, because the, the prophet wanted uh, people to really engage yeah. the text and do an emphasis on it. And one of the most interesting in observations I thought you made about, of course, he made the comment, you know, the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion. 
Mm-hmm. But you actually, uh, one of the one of the statements that I thought was so keen, and I, I really appreciate it, is that it's actually really your testimony of the Book of Mormon is actually the keystone. And I thought that was a very good point. And I want us to kind of talk a little bit about this as you're transitioning to an older age. Now, you don't have a testimony of the Book of Mormon. You also are becoming a teenager and you're dabbling. So you're in this world of pretty orthodox Mormonism, but we also have another side of you no. uh, that isn't uh, following the rules too much. And you're li- kind of leading a double life. Definitely. Uh, I, for whatever reason, I don't have a good explanation for it, but I fell in with my group of friends. You know, we were pretty rebellious. Um, I still do listen to a lot of punk rock, but that was one, that was one of our entrees. We, we all listened to punk rock and played in punk rock bands and skateboarded and, and, you know, that's all harmless enough, but that started to get more serious as I started to get, you know, 14, 15 years old, this is devolving into, you know, eventually a lot of drug use and alcohol use and pretty, pretty hard drug use um, through high school. And so I was in definitely this sort of in this double life where we're sneaking off and doing that on the weekends, but I'm you know showing up to sacrament meeting on Sunday mornings and, and just kind of pushing it out, trying not to think about it, uh, of, of the, the dissonance between those two things. But around the time, as I started to get to the end of high school and the pressure is kind of mounting about, is Jeremy going to serve a mission? Because I think there was some question in the air. People, you know, I, I, my parents knew there were some problems and, and my dad served a mission. All of my older brothers had served missions. So there was some pressure to do that. And I don't think. I think a lot of times in these in conversations you hear from ex-Mormons, they talk about that like it's a bad thing. I don't think it is. I think a mission um, for a lot of people does a lot of good, and it certainly did for me. It's one of the most foundational and formative experiences of my life. And I was, you know, struggling with a lot of different things and did what everybody told me to do. I picked up the Book of Mormon one day and I opened it up and just started reading and you know it was this powerful experience just like i had been taught of this burning in the bosom this overwhelming feeling sense of god is listening to me and these words right here are exactly what i needed to hear and a feeling of peace and being okay with things and it was just a click like that's it. This is what I've been taught my whole life is, you know, I'm supposed to have a testimony. You hear people bear their testimonies and fast and testimony meeting. I hear my parents do it. The church teaching all the time about you need to read the book of Mormon. And if you do so, and you do it sincerely and you pray and ask God, then by the power of the Holy ghost, he will manifest the truth of it unto you. And by the power of the Holy ghost, you may know the truth of all things. Right. And and it was just this this moment that it clicked. Um, and from sort of that moment, I thought, like, I have a testimony of the Book of Mormon. I know it's true. It's just, you know, it, it still took some time for me to kind of write my life. That didn't, like, fix it overnight. But, um, you know, I, I just had started involving myself deeply in faith in religion in reading and trying to understand, you know, reading. Um, like I, I read Jesus the Christ in like a week or something. Mm-hmm. I just devoured it. And, and at that time, you know, there were, there were other things going on in my life with, with friends starting to get in trouble with the law, with, you know, our, our lifestyle. Uh, and, and it really saved me. It really saved me out of that. I had friends go to prison um, a really kind of nasty time. And it, it pulled me out of that. And I, it's so, it's so funny because one of the, the reasons I wrote the book was because I had friends and family sincerely ask me, did you ever really have a testimony? And it baffled me that anybody could ask me that question because I knew it was true. I knew it was true. It, I knew it as much as anybody else knew it was true. Um, 
I believed that I knew it was true. <laughs> and, and it was so important to me. Uh, Mormonism was everything to me, certainly from that sort of from that point out. And I, you know, got things in order so that I could serve a mission. And I really was, you know, on fire for the church. Like I was very excited. I was scared to go on a mission because it was just in my my nature. Like I said, I did a lot of growing up, a lot of maturing as a missionary. Uh, you're, you're a young kid. It's It's crazy. When you get this many years on, you know, I'm 36 now and you look back and you're like, wow, you know, 19 years old and off to off to Argentina and unsupervised all day long, just standing up in buses and knocking on random people's doors and stopping people and um, getting into all kinds of misadventures. It's it's kind of wild to, to think about in retrospect how young you are. But I, you know, I really had a desire to share my faith with other people. Yeah, so I think that's what comes through in this book is that you you really did um, check all the boxes of being a, a faithful Mormon. Uh, you you the, in one sense, and this is what I th th find beautiful about your book is that it really isn't you're not there to bash anything. You're just you're just kind of detailing your journey, which I find so fascinating. And I I think it's a it's a it's a really good book for a lot of reasons. And you know, I, I want you to continue telling your story. But I also kind of want to just kind of bring in the book here. And actually, I want you to explain the title, first of all. Sure. What made you come up from the Susquehanna to the Tiber? Explain to me the significance of this uh, this title. And then and then we're going to circle back, tell a little bit more about your story. And then we're going to talk about um, your journey into Catholicism. Okay. So the title, I, I don't remember when I came up with it. It was, I initially wrote the memoir as a personal project when someone challenged whether I'd had a testimony. I sat down and was like, I've never sat down and thought through all of this. I have not actually processed this journey as a whole. And I do a lot of writing. I write for a living as a lawyer. I do a lot of writing. And it is a way that I think. I think on paper. And so I sat down and started to, to put this together. Uh, and one of the big sources, you know, I kept a journal for 10 years or so, really detailed journals. And that was a huge source of like all of that time period was going back through my journals and rereading them. And I, the, the title kind of came about at some point after I had decided to try and publish it. And you're trying to think of a title, which is hard. You want to think of something good and think of something that captures the essence of what you're trying to write about and the story you're trying to tell and for me, it really was um, this journey from the Susquehanna, where allegedly in an indeterminate date in 1829, perhaps, uh, that Peter, James, and John are supposed to have appeared to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery and bestowed on them the keys of the kingdom from Matthew chapter 16. And going on this journey from knowing that that was true, because I knew that was true. I talk about that. I talk about when I was ordained uh, to the Melchizedek priesthood. And, and when my father recited my priesthood lineage and his priesthood lineage and having those same, that same burning in the bosom, this deep feeling that this is true. And, and he talked about that. He talked about that moment um, on the banks of the Susquehanna during my, my ordination and it was so powerful and moving, you know, I was just bawling, crying. And uh, to move from that to the Tiber, the Tiber River of Rome, right? There is a, a cliche in Catholicism uh, where people will talk about swimming the Tiber, which is a, a euphemism uh, to converting to Catholicism. And, and I think in that, we can get into this later, but in my mind, the title sort of captures most principally a difference in the approach to the question of faith and reason represented by these two religions. And that the approach to faith and reason that you get at on the Susquehanna is very different from the approach to faith and reason from the perspective of the Tiber. And I think that's one of the kind of the main arcs of my memoir and really of my story is coming to think about God and faith and reason in a very, very different, different way. 
Yeah, and so uh, it, I thought half my audience would know one of the rivers, and the other half might know the other or so. Yeah. And so I thought I love how you tied this these rivers together, and I thought what a what a wonderful way to name the book. And I think it's really it's interesting because of course you've talked about how much Mormonism um, really in many ways kept saved your life, kept you on the straight and normal, uh, gave you some really great values. You're yeah. very indebted to your family and to your church for all, for the life that you live now, where you're at in a lot of ways is why you're successful is because of your upbringing, the church, the community. Uh, you had a beautiful story about how the community came around and helped with, with logs and your father was, you know, with firewood and stuff and your father was sick. So you, you recognize the beauty of Mormonism the beauty of its scriptures, the beauty of its people and everything. And you, and you really are not, you know, and, and so you see a lot of these positive attributes. Then as your journey continues, of course, you being a lawyer, uh, you know, you, you going to law school and then that, that, that causes you to, uh, you know, approach things a little bit differently as you're going through, you know, you, as you're kind of learning how to be a lawyer and how to think critically and to try to seek out evidence and see where the evidence leads and all these kinds of things. So you're kind of using these tools as well. So maybe talk a little bit about your transition from, uh, you know, being a kid comes out of missionary and then uh, out, of, out of your mission, gets married, has kids. Maybe talk a little bit about your family, how you met your wife. Let's talk a little bit about that first, and then we can talk about your journey. Yeah. So I, you know, I I served my mission, um, and and loved it and um, really grew. Uh, when I came home, I did what every you know good Mormon boy does. I set about <laughs> looking for a wife. <laughs> uh, and I met my wife at Institute uh, on, you know, a Tuesday or Wednesday night. Um, I, you know, I saw her, I didn't know her, I was attracted to her, I immediately started, you know, I feigned some, I found out she was an English teacher at the high school that I had gone to, she was, she had just graduated from BYU, and was doing, had finished her student teaching, and then was teaching in Blanding, and I, I don't know, I made something up about if you have any good books to like recommend me or something, um, just as to try and get an in to start talking to her. And we started dating and had a, a very stereotypical Mormon courtship, like very fast dating. We were engaged. We met in like February or March of 2008, and we we're engaged by the summer and got married in September. Uh, we were sealed in the Los Angeles temple. My wife's from Southern California and, uh, and started our family. We had kids right away and we're super involved in church. I, I, we're just, I am just the everyday Mormon guy you knew at church. We, we you know, we're really involved. I was in a bishopric uh, when I was like 22 which was stressful. Um, and, you know, elders quorum presidencies and those, those kinds of things. And, and we're involved. Uh, and a lot of those, you know, Mormonism has a lot of ambition, I think for young men, like or it was, when, when it, there was, you know, you look up to who are your kind of religious role models within the church and it's the brethren, right? And you look at them, they're doctors and they're lawyers, they're professionals. They, um, and so, you know, I, I, I definitely think that influenced why I decided to go to law school and become a lawyer and be a really hardworking professional. I think there were some definite negatives about that, that's, that played a role in the undoing of my faith in Mormonism. And part of that was, you know, in law school, there are kind of two different things that are happening. I went to law school in Salt Lake City uh, from 2011 to 2014. And I was in an elders quorum presidency and then later got called. To, they split. Our elders quorum was so one of those big ones and they split it in two. And I got called to be the elders quorum president. So I'm doing that. And that's just a ton of work. And this was in a, you know, this is like more of a downtown Salt Lake City ward. There are a lot of welfare needs. So. Like I spent a lot of time, I'm like going to the law school at six o'clock in the morning, leaving at six o'clock at night, a little bit of time for dinner, out doing elders quorum kind of stuff, and then studying super, super late into the night over and over and over. And so that that's sort of a, 
an emotional, mental kind of stressor that's that's working on me. And, um, you know, the real breaking point, it's silly. And I, t- I talk about it, it's kind of ridiculous. And I, th- I think there might be some LDS people who read the story and are like, that's it, that's what broke you. Um, and so I get a little embarrassed to tell it, but, but it's true. So I, so I tell it, you know, I received a, when I was set apart as elders quorum president, the stake president gave me a blessing and I had been doing very, very well in law school and exceptionally well. And people knew that. And I was really, you know, just stressed about getting good grades and because it's really important in law school, especially if you want to wind up kind of where I'm at now, where you work at a very large law firm. And the University of Utah is a great law school, but it's not Harvard, it's not Yale. So you kind of have to do a little bit extra to kind of weasel your way into some of these bigger law firms and and whatnot. So grades were really important. And this stake president gave me a blessing and promised me that I would perform on my upcoming exams just as I expected to. And I had this like overwhelming emotional relief because I had been so stressed about it with with everything. And it was like I, I tend to say, it was indistinguishable from any other time I had felt the spirit. And I felt such relief. And then grades came out, you know, after exams. And in a really important course, I got a bad grade. <laughs> I got a grade that was not up. It was was not what I would have expected. It was not in line with how I'd been doing. And it really emotionally devastated me because it it impacted my career. And I, I, in fact, did lose some job opportunities because of that. In, uh, and, and so it was, it, it really hurt. It was just a simple, you know, God, why did you do this to me? How come I thought this was going this, this way? Uh, why'd you do this to me? And it really spiraled. I, I got depressed. Um, uh, you know, I, I had suicidal ideation. I had to, I went and saw uh, a doctor at the Madsen clinic there at the university of Utah who helped me start taking care of the things I needed to, to be, mentally okay and um you know the stake president i i went to i was like I, I can't do my calling anymore i'm just this is just all too much and he was very gracious and and released me from my calling as elder scorn president and so i had a little bit of time to kind of emotionally recuperate but it caused doubt and i didn't even realize how much doubt it caused until i went back and i read my journals from mm-hmm. the time uh, I, at the time, it didn't occur to me that it it made a crack of this like, wait, I have had, you know, I detail this in the book, a lot of experiences that I understood to be the Holy Ghost and that, that cashed out in a way that confirmed to me that that was the Holy Ghost. And, you know, this just hit up against reality really hard and it was just causing so much conflict. So that's one set of things. And the other set of things that's going on at the same time is anybody who lived in Salt Lake in 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14 uh, would know that there were issues going on in the church. (laughs) It was just inescapable. And I think all the more so being in a somewhat intellectually driven profession, right? You're in Salt Lake City, the church is inescapable anyway. And you start hearing about, you know, statements by church leaders about people leaving. Talks in general conference start to get sort of oriented toward this idea. The Tribune is reporting on people resigning their membership over difficult historical issues. Uh, I, I remember, you know, this guy, John DeLynn, causing all these, you know, all these issues. And, and then he gets excommunicated in this very sort of public way. And Were you uh, watching uh, Mormon stories at the time? Okay. So no, just- I never, I never, uh, when it, I, I, re- I feel ashamed to say it, but I'll say it. Uh, when John DeLynn was excommunicated, I said, good riddance to bad mm-hmm. women. Yeah. That, that's how I thought. That's how I was. Even dealing with the doubts I was having was still 
you know, I, I had no empathy or compassion for him at the time. And I feel, you know, I feel bad about that now, but, but that, that's how I felt. And at the time, I just reached a point at some, at some point, and it, it might've been around the time the church released the essays, the gospel topics, essays. gospel topics, essays. Mm -hmm. And I just had this moment, a real honest moment internally. I like, I remember it. And I just really thought, what if it's not true? Isn't it possible that it's not true? And if it isn't true, wouldn't I want to know that? Isn't that really what's most important to me is if it's true or not. And I want to know that if it's not. And that's scary. It was very scary. It's very, it's terrifying to even think that, but I had the real thought, not just sort of abstractly, but kind of maybe it's not. Well, let me ask you a question because a yeah. lot of people really didn't know about the essays. It's kind of not a very well-known gospel topics essays. How did you come across and find out about the essays? You know, I don't recall exactly. I think I remember having a conversation with my in-laws when they released the image of the brown seer stone mm -hmm. of, if I recall, like they didn't know, I think my father-in-law knew about it. He'd read Rough Stone Rolling. Maybe my mother-in-law didn't. And I rem I knew about it. I, I, I also want to just caveat, like I wasn't, I didn't fall off the tournament truck turnip truck yesterday i i was not unaware of joseph smith's i come from polygamy stock i was not unaware of joseph smith practicing polygamy i was not unaware that joseph smith had used seer stones and that he had done some treasure digging i was not ignorant about where would you have found about read about that stuff as a faithful mormon how would you have even known about that stuff i remember reading some of it when i was getting ready to go on my mission just on the internet i i read um back then you know farms and i read a lot of hugh nibley and reading like hugh nibley so i knew that mace that masonry had you know really influenced uh the temple endowment i knew that and but i read stuff like hugh nibley and some of his apologetics uh, particularly stuff where he relies on some of the Gnostic, you know, writings in, in early Christianity that he uses as, as a, as a frame to kind of paint the endowment as, as having roots as existing in early Christianity. And I remember I listened to Truman Madsen. He has a, a, a recorded series about Joseph Smith and he briefly touches on some things like seer stone, I think, and treasure digging, but, but really, uh, superficially and kind of writes it off. And, um, you know, I, I had just such a deep love for Joseph Smith from listening to that. I remember in the MTC in 2005, when Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration movie came out and they like screened it for us and just being overwhelmed. Like I went home or not home. I went to, to our dorm in the MTC that night and I wrote my testimony just so firmly of Joseph Smith. So moved. Uh, and I, I don't recall exactly where I had read about those things. And I don't recall where it, it might be in the book. I just don't even remember. I, I have not reread the book. There's one thing you learn about writing a book. Once you write a book, you've read it so many times you never want to read it again. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, these, these essays are sort of out there in the ether that the church is like, you know, confronting some of these things and trying to explain. And I just saw it as like, they're just trying to put context to, to these things. And, um, but I, you know, I started to read them and I started, I'd had this moment of like, look, I'm just going to look at this. I understand in law school, you know, I was on the executive board of our, of our law journal I understand what scholarship is. Um, I understand what polemics is. As a lawyer, you 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 start to understand the difference between advocating, which isn't necessarily wrong. Uh, just you understand there can be a difference when a client asks you, "Tell me what my risk is," versus "Now go win for me <laughs> or defend me." Right? Those are two different kind of propositions. And I decided to just read 
and make a judgment from books that I had understood were not the kinds of things I should be reading, but things that the church did not want, you know, want us to read or, or to look at. I started reading through primary sources. I started reading through um, people like Michael Quinn, Grant Palmer. Uh, Dan Vogel was a little bit later. Uh, I read No Man Knows My History by Fun Brody. And a lot, I just read voraciously. I read, you, you can't see it, my my Mormon bookshelf's on the other side of the room. It's over there. Uh, but I just started reading a lot. I read a lot about Mormon historiography, which is also a fascinating topic in and of itself. But um, uh, some of Greg Prince's books, right? His uh, David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism, such a fantastic book. Um, and uh, his book on Leonard Arrington, that came out a little bit later. I was sort of through, but... Um, through my faith transition, but, you know, reading that I read stuff by the Tanners, uh, who I had always sort of, you know, heard or uh, sort of that, you know, they're, they're, they're a byword, uh, the, you know, you don't read the Tanners, you don't read Fawn Brody. Um, I had listened to, uh, Hugh Nibley's cleverly titled no ma'am, no ma'am, that's not history. Uh, and, but, but I sat and I just started reading it and, it didn't take that long. I'll be honest. It didn't take that long for me to sit and hear an interpretation. All, all history is interpretation. History is doesn't interpret itself. Um, but to see all the evidence and the data points. And I saw, I think the first time it really clicked was reading No Man Knows My History, which isn't correct on everything. You know, a lot of, of Brody has been revised over time but i read that and i thought this sounds more like the man joseph smith than the movie that i watched and that's the thing that's the thing what i love about no man knows my history is it it even though i disagree with some of her conclusions sure uh, and there, and i do think she comes across it across a little cynical about him um, I have to say that she does humanize the man. And you had even had a moment where you started crying mm. over, a, it's almost like you got to know Joseph, the man, the person, yeah. in No Man Knows My History. And you actually kind of broke down when you're reading about the martyrdom in the book. Yeah, I was on a flight um, headed to San Francisco for work and I read it. I finished it and I, you know, I just wept um, at the the finale of that book at his death. And it wasn't, it was different. It was an emotion, not of, a, of testimony, but it was this just experiencing a real person who I think, you know, Joseph Smith is a fascinating person. He's a fascinating character. He's a character worthy of understanding just as a historical artifact. Um, I think he's, he's a remarkable person in many ways. Um, and I, and, and I don't mean that to say it positively and I don't mean to say it negatively. I just mean he is a fascinating subject. And I think Brody does a nice job of laying out the charisma, the inventiveness um, the ad hocness of Joseph Smith. He's he's he has a gift for being off the cuff very well, and he's charismatic. And you know, I, I similarly I didn't agree with everything that I read from her. Some things seemed implausible, uh, but I, I just kept reading, you know, and and a different picture fell into place. The more. Yeah the more that I read about well, you had even commented about how Richard Bushman in his book, uh, rough stone rolling actually gives a lot of credit to Fawn Brody. And it caused you to come up with a, uh, a line that I think is really, really good. And I'll start it off is uh, play uh, Western civilization is a footnote of Plato. And what is Fawn Brody? <laughs> Mormon history is a footnote to Fawn Brody. Exactly. Which I find that's a, that's a great summation. I think that says a lot. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that, that was your entry point into like looking at Joseph differently, but at the same time, not like looking at him necessarily negatively, just looking at him more as a human. 
And of course, a lot of people have, you know, that's one of the things I think a lot of, when I did my episode on the Joseph Smith photo, which was the mm-hmm. first uh, interview uh, for, in the most watched video on YouTube about the Joseph Smith photo, a lot of people were resistant to it because it, they have this vision of this man that, that you know, the kind the Kendall, uh, right. you know, Joseph Smith, right? Uh, it presented in the movie, right? <laughs> that he, that, yeah. you know. um, and then, then, then you look at, this is a man, uh, you know, and so, so, so you, that's the human part of Joseph Smith that people have to grapple with. Um, and so some people are resistant because they have an idea in their mind, but a lot of people, you know, and so I think that's the key thing is that there's a lot going on with Mormonism, a lot going on with history. And I want to say, this is the thing too. I love your, some, I love this book because I want to recommend this, especially for those of you who are not familiar, like maybe you're a Catholic who's wanting to know Mormonism, uh, evangelical. I get a lot of evangelicals reach out to me, um, doing research on, on, on Mormonism, um, and ask me questions. And I want to say that if you're looking for a, a pretty good, actually a very good summation of a lot of the scholarly issues, a lot of the new developments in Mormon scholarship in the 20th century, but also in particular the last 30, 40 years, like you had mentioned, Michael Quinn, Dan Vogel, uh, and, and of course, Bushman and all this, all these people, all the different. And then you give a nice summation about all the different things, including the gospel topics essays, your you know, people who are excommunicated um, and just all the tumult that's going on. So if you want just a good like two chapter summation of the, the the story of Mormon scholarship over the last 30, 40 years and a lot of the conclusions that are different than what the official church narrative is. And then we it all comes up to now the Gospel Topics essays, which then acknowledges much of this research. And so I think that's a great place. And, and again, that all that research is it's, it's really good. I, 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 I'm sure that people can find things in here and quibble with it. But overall, I think you did a great job giving a great summary of uh, the state of Mormon scholarship and how much of an effect it's had on the church as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. It, 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 you know, is, I try to um, just give a sense of, for me, there was not a, an issue. There was not a single issue that was like, that's it. It was really the totality. And so I've tried to just summarize some of the bigger, broader points. I think people who are familiar with controversies in Mormon history, including faithful LDS people, I don't think there's likely to be a whole lot in there. They have not at least heard uh, at some level. So I don't think it's, I think I even say this presentation is not novel. <laughs> I am, you know, I am trying to synthesize and summarize the the things I have read. I have a, a short bibliography in the back of sort of starter materials for people to read, uh, Vogel, Bushman, Quinn, Brody, Rittner on the book of Abraham and, and the like. Um, but I, you know, I read, I read the gospel topics essays and they were concerning to me because they, they felt to me at the time, not entirely forthright. Some of them, at least some of them felt, uh, I understand that they're trying to be faith promoting at the end of the day, but there were some of them that I felt were really not on the level. I, the book of Abraham essay, I really thought at times was not on the level. I thought the essay about blacks in the priesthood was not, I I thought it was misleading. Um, I thought it was misleading in, uh, on an important question, this is an important question for Catholics too, right? Of like, what is, if you, if you ask somebody, what is Mormon doctrine? What is doctrine? And how do you know? Where is it in, where in the world of Mormonism do you look to know what is official church teaching? Like, where is that set forth? A lot of times you'll hear people say, well, it's in the standard works. Okay. Well, where does that, where, where's that? Where in the standard works does it say in the revealed parts, right, that these are official church teaching? And and it was important because on, for instance, the issue of blacks in the priesthood, my own take, and I think people can disagree with this, but I think it is implausible to suggest that, that the teaching that had supported the ban on blacks holding the priesthood uh, was just a policy was just like I, I think it was much more than that that that's my own read of of things of the history um and I thought that there were statements about 
Joseph Smith's polygamy that I think were a little bit misleading. And I find that's an area that, you know, is very, very complicated for people. Uh, I, my own, I don't know. I just took a, a realist approach, a sort of lowest common denominator. And I know there are a lot of historical debates about who did Joseph Smith consummate his marriages with and how old were they at the time and who, who he didn't and who he did and who, which were spiritual only and which, you know, which, et cetera. And I just sat back and in my own mind, I thought the simplest explanation, it seems to me, is that this was done in secret. Uh, this does appear to me to have been beginning in its beginning, in its inception, to to be, you know, sexual dalliances uh, that steamroll. And a lot of my take on early Mormon history is is this. I try to sum this up in the book. This these, these were my conclusions: were that a lot of things about Mormon history and Mormon doctrine began as one thing in one context, and later on begin to to be sort of given a different context. So I tend to think I, 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 if my reading of Dan Vogel is correct, I'm sure he may comment on this if it's wrong. <laughs> but uh, my reading of Dan Vogel's understanding, which is cautious, is that the story of the angel Moroni and the like is a, a, a religious veneer, I don't mean that pejoratively, but a religious veneer to a set of events that had a very different context when they were unfolding. So that Joseph Smith's, one of a number of Joseph Smith's early treasure quests that fit the context of a treasure quest, in the course of a, a short period of time, just a few years, sometime between 1823 to 1827, begins to take on a religious a distinctively religious sense, right? That I don't know if it's the the 1826 trial and the fallout with Emma's father or what. I think Dan Vogel plausibly suggests those have something to do with it and his promise that he's not going to do these things anymore, that, that those events take on, you know, what once was a guardian spirit is now an angel. A golden treasure is also now a religious, you know, book, this project becomes a religious project. I think that polygamy struck me the same way as I I read the history and it looks to me that the Fanny Alger affair was an affair and that later testimony saying it was like a plural marriage is anachronistic, that it seems to me to have been otherwise. And, and, it, and it changes sort of evolves over time and that th those were my i know other people could take other conclusions away um and other smart people can take other conclusions away from reading that history but those those were mine and it just i i wrote this down because initially i wasn't like like what i wrote in my journal and and what i said to my wife when i told her was whatever else the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is. And I don't know what that is, but whatever else it is, isn't what it claimed to me to be. And whatever else, whoever else Joseph Smith was, I don't believe he was a prophet. Whatever mm -hmm. else he he was, because I don't have all the answers, um, but things are just not as I understood them. The predicate for my testimony turned out for me to be different. And the the presuppositions of my testimony turned turned out to not be correct, mm. and and so I you know I I told my wife I'm I'm done with this. I I can I kept going to church every week. <laughs> it's kind of funny. People will be like, "When did you stop being Mormon?" And I was like, "Well, like in my own mind and in private conversations, including with bishops, you know, it was in the fall of 2015." uh that i i was done i kept going to church every week to help my wife and she was still very active we had four children at the time i was the one who you know 
reneged on the deal essentially. So I, I didn't feel like it was just for me to be like, well, I'm, I'm done with this and you all have to leave this. And I, it was so emotionally devastating to me to, to come to these conclusions. I was not interested on interested in visiting that on anybody else. I did not. I had, my wife wanted to have just a couple conversations to understand why and where I was, but I did not push this at her. I didn't, when I told my family, I said, I don't want to debate this. I don't want, I don't want to sit down and have a debate. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> that, that was my approach. I don't know if that was the right approach, the wrong approach. I was just like, this is the conclusion I've come to. And I don't want to talk about it because usually what happened if people did want to talk about it was what I think, and this would be my advice. This is not new advice, but this would be my advice for Mormons dealing with someone who's going through this. Cause there are a lot of, if you are an active Mormon, somebody, you know, is probably going through this process. And the, I know that the church tells you that this is the right answer, but I would humbly suggest it's not. Don't bury your testimony to people who are going through this. That is not, every time somebody did that, I said, I'm, I'm making the right decision. <laughs> I have made the right decision because the answer is not, well, let's sit through and talk talk through these things. The answer was, let's not talk about those things, but I know because I have a testimony from the Holy Ghost that it's true. And that that to me struck me as the, as the wrong approach. I can uh, I could see that. Yeah, I could I can understand why, especially when you're you know, because you know so much, you 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 realize that that's almost like a cop out in the conversation. And so for you, I can understand why that would be that would be a, a real hard thing to have to hear that, especially because they're really not interested in hearing what you have to say. That's why you didn't want to talk about it. Right. And I didn't want I mean, like I just it was devastating. I did not want to put other people through it. Yeah, uh, it was a dark, dark time. And it was also like most of these conversations are really not productive mm. because it, it's two ships passing in the night. And for somebody who says, I really want to engage my reason with these questions to have the response be, I want you to set aside reason as it were. And I want you, I, you know, have people tell me, remember how you felt when you got your testimony. Remember how you felt when you prayed and got an answer. And that to me was the problem. I, I just had this, you know, it's the, the epigram to the book uh, that really sums up how I felt. It's Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine. This is the King, King James Version, but uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? And that's really just how I felt. I felt like I had lived life thinking about what was true and what was not true based on how I felt about it. And I know I, I also, I wasn't, you know, I knew that priesthood leaders are not perfect. I mean, I served a mission. I saw priesthood leaders say things and blessings that made my eyebrows come off my, you know, come off my face. And I knew that there was a difference between, or at least I thought I knew there's a difference between our emotions and the Holy ghost. And I know that the, that is usually caveated, but in my, in my experience and experience with other people I spoke with when I wrote the book to say, is this the experience you had? And was it was it just me that how I describe the testimonial experience and that emotion is very, very common. And and when I talk to Catholics about this, I say, and I, and I don't mean this in any way to, to faithful LDS people who are listening. I don't mean to denigrate your faith. And so please don't take it that way. I really don't mean it that way. But I will say, you know. It's the feeling, the testimony of the Holy Ghost in the Mormon context for most people is a feeling that everybody has. We all, we all have those moments of 
strong emotion in reacting to seeing things that are good or beautiful that move us. And I think, um, you know, when you're raised in a context to believe that when that coincides with, say, contemplating an abstract truth proposition, like Joseph Smith is a true prophet, when those two things happen at the same time, when you're taught your whole life that that is a, a, a special way of knowing kind of infallibly, right, something is true, irrespective of what other whatever other evidence you're looking at, it has a real, it's, it's really powerful. Um, and, and it really is hard for, it was hard for me to leave Mormonism because it's, it's really dark to stare out into the abyss and, and remember all those decisions you made in your life as a subject of prayer and, and feeling that response and making big decisions in life and to contemplate that maybe it wasn't God. Just to, to, to face up to that is a dark thing. It's very scary to sit there and think, why am I in the profession I'm in? Why did I go to school where I went to school? Why am I married to whom I'm married? Why have I done all of these things I've done? It, it, it pulls out the, the rug of meaning <laughs> right from out under you very swiftly. And, you know, I feel a lot of compassion for people who go through that. And I understand why so many people who go through that come out on the other side at best agnostic or come out atheists come out very embittered come out with a sometimes a nietzschean or nihilistic viewpoint because it hurts deeply to have that meaning kind of pulled out from under you yeah yeah no i get that been there done that man yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so i was atheist very hard. Now. um you know i i mentioned this i've mentioned this before but in my interview with don bradley of course he talks about his journey from mormon to atheist to Baha'i, to born-again Christian, back to Mormonism. And one of the <laughs> things I, I mentioned in the interview was people don't realize that when you lose your faith and you become an atheist, and a lot of people who are believers don't understand that atheists are going through a grieving process because they just lost their best friend. And that's really what, whether it's God, the church or God, you lost your best friend. And now you got to get all the pieces back together. And that's that's really where we're at. So I think, you know, so often one of the things I tell people, and this is evangelicals, this is LDS. If somebody becomes an atheist, don't come up with the reasons why they came became an atheist or why they left. You need to ask them and have a real genuine conversation with them. But most people are afraid to have that conversation because they're afraid that they might be hearing something they don't want to hear. Right. And so that's that's to me is sad because that means the people don't have as strong of a faith as they think they do if they're afraid to, to uh, grapple with these things. Um, and, and honestly, and I tell people, the purpose of my program is to challenge your faith, but not to undermine it or destroy it. It's to strengthen your faith, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if it, strengthen your faith journey. And that includes asking the hard questions. So like when people, when I hear criticisms about Chris, Christianity and all this kind of stuff, I don't get offended about it because look, I was an atheist. I was saying that stuff. I was reading all those materials. I read all that stuff. I get where they're coming from. Sure. And so I think that's important that if we want to have adult conversations with these faith transition stories, um, that we need to really engage the people and engage really. It's because most of the time, whether it's evangelical or it's LDS, they'll say it's sin. They wanted to sin. You know, and it was so funny because when I had Aaron Ra on my program, who was one of the biggest atheists on YouTube, head of the like American Atheist Association or something like that. He said, Steve, he said, if I wanted to sin, I'd become a Christian. And what a way to turn to turn it on its head. <laughs> and and so because he's in the Bible belt, once saved, always saved, yeah. type kind of world. And he's like, I'd if I man, I, if I wanted to sit, I'd become a Christian. And I thought, oh, Aaron, that's a very perceptive point on your part. So there's a lot more to this, folks. And then of course, Aaron was a Mormon for a while. Um, and so and a born-again Christian for a while. So he's been through the whole gauntlet. But these are interesting stories, and I think it's important to have you come on this program to tell this story. And and I just want to put a little bow on your historical research, because I want to relate a story. And then I want to kind of transition to you to, talking about your Catholic faith. Sure. How you yeah. becoming Catholic. But I just remember I was flying back from one of my conferences in Utah and I, and I was sitting next to a, a pilot 
airline pilot for the airline I was uh, and he's uh, flying on and we're sitting in the back row and he's in the middle seat. We start talking. And uh, and this is the other thing that's really happened, too, is COVID changed everything. It changed again. And he said, yeah, you know, uh, about a year and a half ago, you know, with COVID and I had all this extra time, I read Saints. You know, he's the LDS from Idaho. I read Saints. And after reading that book, I said, I'm out of here. So it's interesting that, you know, you and the Gospel Topics essays kind of what made it interesting to me is that you kind of questioned. You thought it was almost like they were given too much of a spin. A lot of people who read the Gospel Topics essays think they're anti-Mormon, right? Wow. <laughs> and then somebody could read Saints, a church, the church approved history. And that caused them to lose their faith. So that's kind of where people are at. I tell people, so right now, there's somebody who is a very, very faithful TBM, who believes everything, believes it all. And a month from now, they're going to be, be an atheist. That's how quickly these tra faith transitions are happening. Yeah. And this is happening in the evangelical world. So I'm not trying to put, you know. Yeah, yeah, no. I, yeah. So maybe just, just talk to that. Put a riff on that a little bit. Yeah, it's happening. I, I think it's, it is, uh, there's no religion in the West that is immune from, from this uh phenomena this this is happening i think all over i do think that um you know it is in the mormon context which is all i can really speak to because i haven't been anything else besides mormon and catholic <clears throat> i do find it I, I i there's some logic to why so many uh ex-mormons become atheists i think there's and the logic to it is that this is my own opinion and this might upset people but uh mormonism is uh, uh intentionally divorces itself from broader christianity in a lot of ways and if you grew up when i grew up th there are certain fundamental things about christianity that are to not you know, put too fine a point on it, lampooned a little bit. And that you are left with a definite sense that obviously none of that stuff's true. Like those other religions, other Christian denominations are not true. And so you, but you haven't actually engaged them, right? Like most, most rank and file Mormons have not engaged the the Christian tradition writ large. They don't understand the theology behind it or the historical context behind the theology or its development. Uh, you know, I had, I, I, one of the things we'll get to this in a moment, but you know, part of the fascination with Roman Catholicism was coming to understand that I never knew a thing about it <laughs> that I, I what i thought i knew was not correct or i just really didn't have a grasp on it and so i think that there is a sense in which a lot of mormons instinctively you know th there's a talk i forget um so it's by former elder tad callister and he wrote it for not not a official church publication. It was like one of those like LDS living or something things. And he wrote an article a few years ago that was sort of pushing this idea that's like, well, obviously, all you know, where else would you go? There isn't any other option. There's nothing else out there if you're not going to be Mormon, because they don't teach about eternal families and they don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I, I think that plays in the context of Mormonism. I think that lamentably plays uh, plays a role that I don't know. I think Jana Reese is the one who does has like the actual data on it. And I don't, I do know that I fit into the very single, small, single digit category of people who leave the LDS church and become Catholic or Orthodox. I don't know if a majority of people actually become atheists, a so plurality or if they're becoming nuns, right? But it is, I think there is something about the way Mormonism uh, presents itself vis-a-vis -vis other denominations that contributes to atheism being the, the, the route out. And I think actually in many ways, I, I, I have a lot of, in the past, I had a lot of interactions with Jehovah's Witnesses and it's the exact same type of dynamic going on. Most just, yeah. yeah. And that that's what's so fascinating to me because 
you know, I actually remember my father, uh, we, uh, you know, William F. Buckley used to be on PBS all the time. And of course, I read a ton of stuff. I subscribed to National Review. I was a big fan of William F. Buckley. I remember that. How can a person that smart be a Catholic? This is old school <laughs> Protestantism here, yeah. foreign Protestantism. That's not, that guy is so smart. How in the world could he be a Catholic, right? And that was kind of the world that I grew up in was this caricature of Catholicism. And then this is the thing, too, is the Catholicism that Protestants engage with is medieval uh, Catholicism. Mm -hmm. In one sense, there were a lot of problems with the Catholic Church that led led for there, in one sense, be a need for that Catholic priest to nail those 95 theses to the, to the door, because there were a lot of problems with the church. And But what we don't understand is that that church doesn't exist anymore, that in a sense, that the church that Martin Luther was dealing with, because we have an evolution that goes within the Catholic Church. And what I find so interesting is that you talk about like Newman, the 19th century, you know, uh, convert to Catholicism. And, and of course, I love him too. I think he's really cool. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that I learned engaging Catholicism because I was dabbling with it for a while. I was kind of getting close. You know, I would hang out with priests and uh -huh. they thought I was cool. And I, I, I had friends who were conservative Catholics. And I realized that there's a lot more to Catholicism. The beauty of it is its, its theology. Um, in one sense, Protestantism kind of um, had a role in causing there like to be a counter-reformation and we need to clean things up in our church. So in that sense, you could see the value, uh, the, the utility of the Protestant Reformation that it did in one sense cause there to be reforms in the Catholic Church. And so now the Catholicism that we're dealing with now, post-Reformation, also, of course, goes back to the Church Fathers, the tradition, all this kind of stuff still there. But it's an it's an engagement. There's a lot more to it, dude. And I think that's one of the most eye opening things that I experienced when I was engaging uh, Catholic theology. Yeah, I I was not looking to become Roman Catholic. I was not looking to become anything else. Uh, my wife asked me, "Are, are you going to join another church?" And I said, "My answer was kind of I was sort of as long as they don't stop me from taking the sacrament." No, I had some sense. I still had a connection to God, as vague as it was. And I kind of looked at, at it as like, everybody finds God in their own way. And the way that I have been introduced, introduced to God is through Mormonism. And there's nothing I can do to change that. And I don't believe the central claims about Mormonism, but I still believe in God. And, and um, I spent some time trying to engage, you know, what, my own eclectic version of Mormonism might look like and thinking about that. And I stumbled across um, the writings of now St. John Henry Newman, um, who for, for those listening who don't know, John Henry Newman was a 19th century Anglican priest and scholar uh, at Oxford and part of what was known as the Oxford movement. Uh, who late in life converted to Roman Catholicism at much personal cost and um, and but ultimately became a cardinal of the Catholic Church and was a very brilliant person, very smart um, and an engaging thinker. And he wrote a book called An Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine. And I didn't read the whole book. I I, I got it because I was trying to think through a way of, of sort of can Mormon beliefs evolve? Can, can they be made to evolve over time to maybe the right thing? And I read the introduction to that book and did not understand it. I have a, a very different understanding of Newman now than I probably, when I first engaged with him, and that's come from reading him uh, over and over. But I, I sort of read about his idea of development which is more subtle than people think uh, because it has criteria. It, it does not just mean like change it. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean one thing that co then contradicts another thing. Uh, but I, I started to think about that and, and I ultimately, I kind of don't even know how I searched my Google history. It's in the book. Like <laughs> I stopped writing journals at some point and then I had to reconstruct, like, how did this happen? I went and I pulled up my Google history. Like, what was I Googling and looking at and what YouTube videos were I looking, was I looking at at the time to kind of piece together exactly how it happened. But I came across 
something I'd never heard before, and that was the church fathers, and in particular, the what are called the apostolic fathers. I never heard of these people before, and uh, for those who who don't know, the, the apostolic fathers is the name generally given to the earliest writings of Christianity outside of the New Testament. Uh, some of those writings actually are earlier than some New Testament writings, some are later, all of them subject to the standard scholarly debates about how you date them. But uh, it's a group of people in the apostolic age, people who either claimed to have direct connection to the apostles or by the dating of these things are in living memory. These are people who live in uh, the late first and early second century. So people who have a, a living memory of the apostles or what they would call apostolic men and women, people who learn from the apostles, right? These were real people. There, there were a group of apostles and there were people who learned from them and and this thing actually happened and spread throughout the Roman Empire. And some of these people wrote things down that have survived. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I should, I should read that and maybe I can pluck a few things from that for my own eclectic set of beliefs. Uh, but I, I did not, ex I wasn't going into it thinking I'm going to be a Catholic or learn about Catholicism at all. And I, so I started reading them and reading them roughly in chronological order and was really struck, shocked, dismayed at what my initial thought was, was they, these people don't look necessarily like, I don't see everything in Catholicism all here, like neatly spelled out, but these people strike me as Catholic. These people sound like Catholics. They say things that sound like distinctively Catholic beliefs. And, um, and that troubled me <laughs> because uh, it just, I was like, oh, I thought that, you know, I grew up on, not from my parents really, but just in the ether on a, a bit of, you know, McConkey take on Catholicism, like a Bruce R. McConkey sort of like, or James E. Talmadge, the great apostasy. Like, yeah, clearly, you know, there was pristine early, you know, Christianity was Mormon. And then after the death of the last of the apostles, it was corrupted. And, you know, by the time of Constantine, you have this abominable invention called the Catholic Church. And there were, but there were just things. So one of them that's, that struck me, and this might be controversial to some Protestants, but I, I'm just me. This is just me reading the, the text. Was it seemed perfectly evident to me that these people believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. They spoke about the Eucharist in a way that didn't sound just like a symbol. And that, you know, I didn't believe that was true uh, at the time, but it troubled me just because I knew how important that concept is to Christianity. And I remember thinking like, how do I, and, and I don't mean this offensively to Protestants who don't hold to the real presence. I just, this, these were my actual thoughts. I was like, how do I, how do I consider myself Christian? And I don't adhere to something that really pretty clearly looks like they believe these are the people dying in Colosseums for this. And they really seem to believe this. Uh, nobody until the first person to talk about the Eucharist in a way that's kind of ambiguous is Clement of Alexandria in, I don't know what that is, like two in the 200s or something. But certainly the people prior to that, they speak about it in really literalistic <laughs> kind of terms. Uh, and, and, there, and there were other things. Um, the the role of of apostolic succession and the the bishops and... you know and the other thing too just just so you know folks the yeah. critics of christianity were accusing christians of being cannibals yeah so and it there was were, right the you response know. that yeah the one you know there were the sort of the three um roman uh polemics against the christians were that they practice incest because they would refer to each other as brothers and sisters 
that um, uh, that they practice uh, cannibalism because they have this secret feast at night, you know, where they they eat flesh. Um, and gosh, now I can't remember the third. I should know it. Uh, but but the response of some of these early writers like Justin Martyr uh, or Athenagoras of Athens, people known as the early Christian apologists, people who engaged Greek philosophy and engaged the culture around them to defend Christianity, their response wasn't, hey, no worries. Like, this is just this symbolic thing that we do. That's not the, that's, that's not the response they give. Um, uh, to to that, and when you when you read Ignatius of Antioch, uh, who's writing in the early second century, he writes seven letters that I think most scholars believe as authentic. The shorter versions of Ignatius's letters to to seven churches while he's being shipped off uh, to be executed, and in one of them he writes about uh, warns one of the churches to stay away from the Docetists. And the Docetists are an early group within the greater kind of Christian world uh, from the Catholic perspective, say an early group of heretics who, uh, who posit that Jesus uh, was divine, but an illusion. He was never a, a person. He was like a, a, a ghost figure. Uh, because they have some Gnosticizing tendencies and some um, don't like created reality. And they're they're using the Gnostic kind of tradition about the wickedness of created reality. And, and he says, he says, don't hang around these people. Uh, don't, don't, you know, go to church with these people because they, they, you know, deny that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Lord. And in the context of him, you know, launching a polemic against the Docetists, that's really indicative of, of how Ignatius of Antioch and his audience likely conceive of the Eucharist. And it's it doesn't come off as something novel that he's pushing. Uh, I know some scholars, when Ignatius talks about um, the other one of the other things he's quite famous for is talking about the authority of the bishops, uh, of the need for Christians to uh, to subjugate themselves to the authority of their bishop. I know some scholars view that reading as 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 that idea of the episcopacy starting to really develop and become robust that time, but in any event. The, the Eucharistic theology of Ignatius of Antioch really, you know, really struck me. And this is all a very long way of saying there are all kinds of things that I just didn't really know. I had a friend who was asking me, who's very smart uh, and is a Roman Catholic. And he had asked me once, explain a little bit of Mormon theology. And I did. And he's like, so you're kind of, it's kind of Aryan. And I had no idea what that meant. And I just had this realization, like, I don't know that I really know anything about early Christianity at all. I didn't know what Arianism was. I didn't know what the Arian controversy was. And so I, you know, I started to read and I read and read and read. I would come home every night from work. I would stay up super late and I would just read. And among other things that, that stuck out to me as a, as a non-Trinitarian coming from a non-Trinitarian background, the other thing that, that, grabbed me by the shirt and said, listen, this is the tradition you want to identify with, was um, Trinitarianism in the early church fathers. And the language of Trinitarianism develops over time, becomes more refined as people are thinking through the logic of, of those propositions. But the a simple proposition comes up pretty early that was you know made me think well maybe this is really what they believed uh, well and this is what's interesting because i think you 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 key on to something is that i think that the early early church they would have been more binitarian in their view of yeah. the god jesus you did you can make a pretty solid argument that binitarianism trinitarianism first you know somebody who 
you know, 45 AD probably doesn't have a concept of the Trinity, but they have a concept of that of Binitarianism. I think you can make that argument. So, yeah, so so I'll be careful to not to as a, as a good conservative Roman Catholic not to do a heresy on your show for for me, but uh, I say that I, mean, I, 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 joke, I get but... in trouble all the time. I think I know. I actually, when I wrote the book, I had a patristics scholar, uh, a priest, Roman Catholic priest who is an expert in patristics, look over and um, make sure I wasn't doing a heresy here or there. But but I, I did say, um, and here's some you know some good confirmation bias. When I first read Justin Martyr and Ignatius of Antioch and people who uh, Irenaeus of Lyon who used what's called logos theology, which obviously shows up in the Gospel according to John, right? In the beginning was the Word. Uh, the word is is logos, and this this word is not a word in isolation, right? In in the Roman Empire, in the world of Greek philosophy, to invoke the logos is is to mean something at that time, and uh, you definitely the the Holy Spirit is not a subject of much conversation until I think one of the earliest references that that comes off very trinitarian is athenagoras of athens which is 177 ad but um this the the proposition that to me that i try to explain to LES people to say the trinity is resolving a conundrum of reality that conundrum is this whatever else you think happened in the old testament i know there's a whole conversation about israelite belief and higher criticism and all these things. Just set that aside. It is a historical fact that by the time of Jesus of Nazareth, who was a real person, we are in the time of second, second temple Judaism, which is strictly monotheistic. And every day, Jesus of Nazareth would have recited the Shema, right? Here, O Israel, your God is one God. Every day liturgically, morning and night. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth and his followers believed in the monotheism, the strict monotheism of Second Temple Judaism. And then a thing happens. Jesus of Nazareth is executed. He's, he's crucified under Pontius Pilate. And immediately after his, his death, his believers begin to say that he's been resurrected. And I would also say, you know, if you haven't read, have you read N.T. Wright's The Resurrection of the Son of God? Uh, no, I'm familiar with it. I got it. Excellent. Read it. It's okay. so good. It's very, very good. Um, which was a book that I read that really made me understand the case for the traditional concept of the resurrection. The, the, these are first century Jews who believe that the Messiah Messiah has resurrected and that the resurrection is signaling the imminent end of the world, right? That the eschaton. Mm -hmm. And they start to treat Jesus. Uh, and this comes out, if, if you haven't read Larry Hurtado, who I think is the late Larry Hurtado, a wonderful biblical scholar, New Testament scholar. Uh, people start to treat Jesus in a way that would have only been appropriate uh the the kind of of honor bestowed on him would have only been appropriate in a first century jewish context for the one god of israel they start to pour honors and to speak about him in a way that uh and larry hurtado is a very careful scholar and and he has a very interesting speculation about maybe this is what made paul so mad uh the the why you know Saul oh, of Tarsus yeah. is so angry at this group is that they are talking about this Jesus of Nazareth this executed criminal and they're doing things they are praying to him and they are singing hymns about him that are only befitting they are they are worshiping him and this is Larry Hurtado calls it as you as you put it uh, binitarianism and you see this thing that there is one God. There's only one God. The Father is God. Jesus is God. But there's only one God. And you have to come up with a resolution to that. And the, the Binitarianism 
and Trinitarianism, this theology is the way that resolves this reality. Um, and uh, another, just for people who haven't read Larry Hurtado, I would really say, you know, suggest he's a really great, great read. Uh, and, you know, there is a, there is a definite school of people within a New Testament scholarship who see the worship of Jesus, of Jesus becoming God as like a late development in the first century, right? I think that was a pretty standard view for a very long time. Um, you know, Bart Ehrman revised a lot of his views in light of Larry Hurtado's scholarship. That's just, he says, it happened so quickly, it's volcanic. We can't put a time on how quickly a, 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 a not insignificant group of the followers of Jesus are paying homage to him that is only fit to the one God of Israel. And you got to do something with that. And Mormonism does something with that, which is to uh, adopt generally, as when I was growing up, <laughs> uh, 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 polytheism or henotheism, depending on which school of Mormon theology you, you look at it, is to say, well, you know, resolving that issue is difficult. And we think the real solution lies in there being more than one God. But I don't think that is consistent with early Christianity setting aside Gnosticism and, and some other things. And to, just to tie a bow on this kind of discussion, I think my early conclusion was I had one other conclusion about Mormonism in reading the Church Fathers. And it was, let's take the kind of most radical 19th century German view of early Christian history, sort of a Hegelian dialectic uh, power struggle between the Judaizing tendencies of Peter and James and the whatever it is Paul's doing. <laughs> and this, you know, they are having a fight. They don't even like each other. And it gets, you know, redacted ultimately into what we have. Let's just, just even assuming that, the, the proto-Orthodox, as they are usually called, or proto-Catholic, um, as just a historical fact, are what emerges as victorious, uh, sometimes against all odds, especially if you look at the, the Arian controversy. It's, it's quite stunning that Arianism lost. But there are a lot of identifiable groups who claim the mantle of Christianity, right? There are Ebionites and Judaizers and Gnostics and Docetists. And within Gnosticism, I mean, it's just a huge branch of the Marcionites and uh, all kinds of, all kinds of schools of thought. And granted, we know about them from their adversaries who are proto-Orthodox, you know, um, Irenaeus of Lyon, the, the hardest part about reading against heresies is the gigantic section where Irenaeus of Lyon recounts the various iterations of Gnostic belief. It's, it's a slog to read through that, but there's a thing that isn't there. And it's, and that is a group that plausibly is identifiably Mormon. Like Mormon theology is, is something that's being engaged. There's yeah. none, there is no Mormon theology that's being engaged in the early church history period. Is what Correct. You're yeah. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, yeah. can you find and, and this is a church essay with which I now take special umbrage. <laughs> There's a church essay that talks about some of the fathers and some of their beliefs. Can you find statements by church fathers that, for instance, Origen, who's, who's much later, he's not an apostolic father. He's not a church father. In the Catholic world, Origen is not a church father because he's not Orthodox. But he's an important writer. And yeah, Origen believes in a pre-existence of spirits of Christ, right? right? Mm -hmm. So you can take that and rip that from context and say, oh, see, a hint in a shadow. Or you could say some people interpret Justin Martyr as not fully endorsing creation ex nihilo. Um, I don't, but that is certainly a mainline scholarly view of Justin Martyr. And you can take, or you can take, you know, the, the famous aphorisms of the church fathers about divinization, theosis, that God became man, that man may become God. And strip it from its incarnational theology, or Irenaeus's recapitulation theology. Uh, 
And you can engage in the kind of parallelomania or kind of what I would say hunibly like, you know, pluck a thing here and there. Um, but if you were to look at, or, or, or polytheism, look at the Gnostics, they believe in lots and lots of gods, right? Uh, but it, they don't look anything like the core identifiable beliefs. They hate the flesh. They hate women. They hate like the, the you know, they don't, um, yeah, they believe in a plurality of gods, but they reject 99% of what, you know, Mormonism believes in. Origin, yes, believes in a pre-existence of spirits of kinds, but it's because, ironically, from the perspective of Mormonism that critiques early Christianity for its engagement of Greek philosophy, origin was overly Platonized. <laughs> that it's 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 origin, and maybe if, if you were to critique uh, Justin Martyr on the ground that he doesn't believe in creation ex nihilo, it's because of a, a erring too far on the side of Platonic philosophy that they do these things. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not coming from. Right. So in other words, the great irony is that the, it was the paganization of Christianity led to the, uh, the, the great apostasy, but yet they're then using arguments that were the very pagan. Uh, yes, bolster exactly, it. exactly. Right. Like the preexistence of spirits, a plurality of gods um, and, and creation, you know, not ex nihilo right. were all pagan um kinds of ideas and yeah. i don't mean that like in a pejorative sense i mean uh, the greek philosophical tradition at the time well and this this is the thing i want to just go to a little bit too and by the way this is a fascinating conversation i don't know what your time frame is um i got all the time you want okay um is you know because there's a lot of like i i come i live in a christian community and they also sometimes are a little skeptical of some of the paganism within catholicism sure. and stuff like that and i want to say you do realize the apostle paul quotes a pagan poem in him we move in whom we live and move and have our being it's a pagan poem describing a pagan god that then paul utilizes to describe the christian god yeah so i always say like the hellenization and the paganization that you would say paul was doing it so the, because he was engaging the greek world and i even tell people to say the virgin birth you know a lot of people are say well this is foreign to judaism and I'll even grant you Alma and Isaiah 53 is probably a young woman, probably isn't a virgin. It's in the original Hebrew. I'll, I'll grant that argument. But in one sense, Jesus had to be born of a virgin, not because of Judaism required it. It's because the pagan world required it. Mm -hmm. In other words, to bring to bring monotheism to the greater world, it also had to engage it in the pagan world and using pagan language, including quoting uh, Hellenized stories and and bringing integrating it into the early church does that make sense to you yeah and that's yeah. why when people talk about the great apostasy because of the hellenization the paganization it was there from the start from yeah the very beginning and so then to, to say that to try to say there was this cutoff i i just don't see it that's as a protestant yeah but also as somebody who from from the greater christian tradition that would be one of my critiques i would level and even on my side, people who think that the church is the Catholic Church is pagan, I'm like, well, you don't really understand. There's a lot of things that were going on. I'm sorry, I'll get yeah, off. Yeah, no, no. Like, I mean, again, if you were to look at it from the scholarly perspective, right? There is a, or I say, a scholarly perspective. <clears throat> uh, pretty standard view of the Old Testament is to view right the development of Israelite religion from one of polytheism to henotheism to the monotheism of the second temple era following the babylonian captivity and um and but but people often don't realize that the concept of the one god that is spoken of in the second temple era and if you're looking at it from this perspective from the redacted sort of old testament is you know thoroughly influenced by like the, the view like Philo of Alexandria, right? The Hellenized Jews living right. in the diaspora. Absolutely. And from the Catholic perspective, uh, the, right, like Paul talking about the one God, the unknown God, right? This is, this is in the greatest of the Catholic uh, tradition of natural theology. So it is, a, I was actually looking it up this morning. Today is the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and, uh, the great, you know, synthesizer of the Christian and Aristotelian traditions. 
And it is a dogma of the Catholic faith, infallibly, you know, reaffirmed at Vatican I, that God is knowable through unaided natural reason. Not everything about God. We can't know the inner life of God. The Trinity is a revealed reality about God. But uh, God's existence from the Catholic perspective is knowable through human reason. And you look at Plato, Aristotle, the classical theism, as it is often referred to. And, and that is this, you know, Catholicism views that as uh, in a, in a way, it's like God's revelation of Himself to through created reality to pre-Christian people, apart from Israel. And it, you know, the early Christians engaged uh, the philosophy and the categories in which they thought themselves and in which they you know lived and and taught. And I think uh, I think that the more you read, uh, it isn't. It's just not right. It's just not correct. Um, someone who's good. Have you read Roger Olson's "The Story of Christian Theology"? It's a Protestant book. It's very good. Uh, and I think um, gosh, I got the name of the other guy. I forget. He was a he was a Lutheran who taught at Yale, and then he became Orthodox. And he has a great series on Christianity, a really scholarly one. And the more you read the early church fathers, you know, it's just, it's not true. It's not fair to read them and say, they just got completely Hellenized because right. you just cannot read a church father who is engaging with Greek philosophy, who doesn't also really clearly draw lines. So uh, Athenagoras of Athens is one who is talking greatly about logos theology and Greek philosophy. And he talks about the virgin birth and he is, I, I think it's the of Athens. I may, I may be mistaken on, on that. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's a And he says that, that Christ was born of a virgin, but not, not like your pagan stories. Okay. Not, this isn't your pagan stories. This mm -hmm. isn't, this isn't the God coming down and raping right. a woman, mm -hmm. right? This is not your, your Greek myths. And they do this, you know, there are extensive both endorsements of Plato where some of the fathers thought surely Plato had read Moses. <laughs> um, and, uh, but staunch critiques of, of the inadequacy um, of Plato and, and, Greek philosophy. So I think that just engaging it a fair, a fairer reading is to see the influence of Greek philosophy, which is obviously there, but to also understand it is simply not the case that they all just sat there and thought, we're just going to take like a thing and put Christian words on it, right? That's also really clearly not what's going on. It's much more nuanced and complex when you when you dig into it. Yeah, so, it's really fascinating you know one of the things you know when i was engaged in catholicism and its theology and you know i tell people that I, i'm no longer a calvinist but i still think like one i'm no longer an atheist but i still think like one <laughs> i still so there's a lot of things that would cause me to be resistant to catholicism sure but i remember one i don't know if i if i read it or heard it but i remember one catholic uh theologian saying just remember the holy spirit has a history and that's a good point that they're making, that the, that, that the history of the church and the early church fathers, but also this continuing history that's going on, that you can argue that the Catholic Church is the custodian of that history of the Holy Spirit in one sense. Now, that's probably a little radical of a statement for a Protestant to be making, but I think that argument could be made. Sure. And I think that it's very unfair to Protestants, I think, are unfairly bash on the Catholic Church. I mean, I come from Dutch Reformed background. I mean, I remember my, my grandma teaching me, teaching my younger sister anti-papist nursery, nursery rhymes. So mm. we're not that far disconnected sure. from that world. Um, and, and so, but I, I do think that in many, in many ways, you know, we as Protestants have, uh, have unfairly maligned the Catholics. And I think that we should um, repent of that. Um, and, and, and of course, we are seeing a more reconciliation, of course, with Vatican II, there was a recognition that we are 
separated of, brethren. Yeah, exactly. And so, and of course, my baptism would be valid in your church. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you, if I, if you watch my Mormon stories and your, but do you, do you realize that I am a Catholic? Uh, yeah, I did. I did not. My devout Roman Catholic neighbor secretly baptized me as an infant. Really? Yep. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, so yeah. And we didn't find it till years later. And my mom was at first mad, but then she realized, no, she loved you so much that she did that. Wow. And, uh, and, 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 she, and then I have four other siblings. She did not do it for any of the other siblings, Fascinating. but she baptized me into the Catholic church. So technically, yeah, I was a Catholic from the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's, you know, the, I, I had, when, when I became Catholic, I had to be baptized and, <clears throat> Uh, the Catholic Church does not recognize Mormon baptisms, right? Because you don't use the Trinitarian; they don't use the Trinitarian formula. Well, kind of. It's, kind of it's, well, they say the words, but they don't have a Trinitarian understanding of. Yeah, words, it's, yeah, yeah. There, there was a, a dubia submitted to the Vatican back in early two thousands in a response that said, "No, they're not. They're not valid." We recognize that facially, you know, what what matters for the validity of Catholic. Catholic sacraments is form proper form and proper matter proper form is trinitarian form and proper matter is water and you know you would think they're both there but there's an explanation as as to why they're not but it is you know baptism when when after i decided i was going to become catholic you know it had ramifications for my for my life including the birth of our our next daughter in line because I, I was like we're done but then we had our daughter opal catherine and I pleaded with my wife to let me baptize her because it's a it's this different understanding. And part of the way I persuaded her, let her kind of into that insight was to say, like, from the perspective of the Catholic Church, baptism is it's an indelible mark that never, ever, ever goes away. And that makes you part of the body of Christ. So much so that Protestant baptisms in in by and large are recognized as valid by by the Catholic Church. And uh it has a little bit, you know, has different meaning than the, the covenantal kind of approach to it in Mormonism. And um so it's you know, it's really there was so much learning that happened in that time period of engaging the Catholic tradition, its intellectual tradition. Uh, I noted today is the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. And I started to read John Henry Newman and Thomas Aquinas and just had never heard people talk about religion that way. Um, and to some people, I suppose, like if you haven't read Aquinas, if you haven't read the Summa Theologiae, it probably comes off as very sterile to people uh, because it is very, it's, exacting it's very rational it's very cold but there was something so important to me about that and so unflinching particularly about aquinas when he sets out his famous five ways his the the proofs for the existence of god he he begins he begins each of his disputations in this very long treatise by propositioning the counter and giving strong arguments. And I remember the first time, you know, you have all these visions of what medieval Catholicism was in your head. And you open up Thomas Aquinas, the, the apex, right? Aquinas represents the, the sort of fullest sense of medieval Catholic tradition. And you open up his uh, section on the existence of God, and it begins... It would seem there is not a God. <laughs> and then he lays out, the, he only lays out two arguments. And they are the two most enduring arguments for the non-existence of God that there are and that continue to this day. The one is the problem of evil. And the second is that God is not necessary to explain the existence of the universe. And if if you think of it, like those are really the two most uh, enduring arguments that people engage with. And he also starts it off by refuting the famous 
uh, ontological argument for the existence of God by St. Anselm of Canterbury, who's, a, you know, a, a <laughs> was a renowned person at the time. And, and St. Thomas begins his, his inquiry into whether we can know that God exists by putting out, one, refuting a Catholic saint and saying this argument does not work. The argument is not valid. It does not work, period. You shouldn't believe it <laughs> and then the, and then two laying out two really strong arguments that god doesn't exist and then he proceeds to um to refute them uh in his five ways and that that engagement was very different and this you talk about this journey from the susquehanna to the tiber and one of the ways i would describe that is in the christian tradition we believe that we are made in the image of God, right? As a Mormon, you have a distinct understanding of what that means. To be made in the image of God is that the Father has hands and fingers and toes like I do, right? And that they think of, Christian theology thinks of the incarnation as God assuming a human nature, to use the like proper theological term, but to use less precise words, God becomes man in order that we may then partake of the divine nature. And, and God rescues human nature by taking on a human nature. And that's the, the classic sort of Christian conception of it. Mormonism thinks of God as showing us a path to become gods. And in this Christian tradition, all the way back to the fathers, they, you know, why are we made in the image of God? It's because we have intellect and reason. That that is actually in the Catholic tradition, why we are made in God's image. It is what makes us like, most like God is our capacity to reason. And that was so different. That was just such a different approach to thinking about my relationship to God and and how faith and reason interact with one another that, you know, pulled me in that and a lot of other things, like you said, you know, Catholicism is beautiful. I think people can, there's a reason when you watch a movie and they want to show a really beautiful wedding, a ceremony, they show an old Catholic mass, right? It's beautiful. It's uh, the, the, I had never been to mass and the first mass I ever went to was a Latin, right. Latin mass. And I want to talk about that, but I right. will give you a counter. Okay. Because all those beautiful scenes, that's very true. But every single movie director wants to do a good old fashioned Protestant baptism in the rivers of the waters, like this an old true. brother where are those one of this those are true. some of the most beautiful scenes also too. And very American. Uh, yes. And America is a Protestant country, uh, through and through. And yes, yeah, so so I, I I will concede you that. But um <laughs> I only mean that the But I get what you're saying. I you know, the yeah. baptism scene in The Godfather. Mm -hmm. uh, is part of what it is because of the, you know, the traditional Catholic dialogue. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his pumps and all his empty promises? And, you know, Michael Corleone is saying yes on behalf of his godson while he's having the leaders of the five families oft, you know, in mm -hmm. other locations. And uh, there, there's something very beautiful about liturgy. Mm -hmm. uh, which was completely foreign to me. And I, in some sense, I just thought, you know, coming from a, the Mormon worship atmosphere to the liturgical world of the mass, uh, I thought to myself, you know, this seems, uh, I know it's full. The mass is an evolving thing full of things that are added over time through pieties that then get approved. And that's actually part of its beauty is its organic nature. Um, but it, it, there are things about the mass that are so old. Uh, you know, when we go to, it's an option in the, in the um, ordinary form, the vernacular mass that you go to, that's sort of updated since the second Vatican. That came. means it would be in the language uh, like English yeah. here in America. English or Spanish, Spanish or whatever, not Latin. Sorry. 
But when you go to the extraordinary form, as they call it, the, the Tridentine or the Latin mass, uh, there's a part that's always said in the Catholic mass uh, that is known as the Kyrie. Uh, and we say Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Christe eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, which is Greek, not Latin, uh, and is reflective of the time prior in Rome when that portion of the Mass was still said in Greek. So this is probably reflecting, you know, prior to the third century that this this part comes from, and it shows up in in the Roman Rite. Uh, and it shows up in the Eastern rites and the divine liturgy that is celebrated by the Orthodox and Eastern Catholics, uh, that there are these parts, I don't know, there's something very grounding to it that makes you feel, it makes me feel connected to, okay. makes me feel, especially as a Roman Catholic, to hear what's called the, the Roman canon, the canon of the mass, which is the portion just prior to the consecration. And then just after the consecration of the Eucharist and the recitation of the names of the Roman martyrs. There's, there's just something so that connects you so deeply to, uh, to these people, these men and women uh, who were brutally murdered and tortured sometimes, right. For the Christian faith. That's something that's, it's just very beautiful. And all the, all the incense and the candles and, the Gregorian chant speaks to me uh, and touched me in a, in a very unusual way that, that attracted me to that. Well, this has gone quite a bit longer than I anticipated, but I'd like for you to kind of put a bow on this because sure. of course you convert. Uh, do you regularly attend a Latin rite church or do you, uh, 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 what is, what is, what, tell me yeah, about so, the church you attend. So let me, and let me make a clarification of terms. Please. Latin rite is not the, so Latin rite refers to, uh, is synonymous oh. with Roman with Roman rite. Right, it refers to the expression of the Catholic faith. That's Latin, and then you have attached the, to the Roman the, the Roman tradition right. in right. Latin West. Right, uh, a, there is the Byzantine rite, the Melkite rite, um, and refers to those particular expressions. But uh, I, 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 um, as you may or may not know, the Holy Father Pope Francis has has put some restrictions on, yeah. on the mm -hmm. celebration of the Latin Mass. Our parish in Alexandria, Virginia, was given a dispensation by the Vatican to continue with pretty much no restrictions to celebrate okay. the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, but my my sons serve at the Latin Mass and they serve at the the English Mass. Okay, um, and we. If I can't make it or what, it, like I have no problem going to either one. Uh, I just really love the Latin Mass, um, and it feels like home to me. So you make me want to go look up where is a, where can I attend a Latin uh, uh, service around here? In yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I I just I guess what I really want you to do now is I'm going to kind of tie a bow on this. Is what is Catholicism? What I mean, you've told a story why you're a Catholic. Um, maybe explain to a Mormon why you're a Catholic now, and what and what it's been, done for you, what how it's impacted you, and maybe just try to, I don't know, just work on that. Yeah, make my pitch. No, um, <laughs> make your pitch. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Catholic because I sincerely believe it's correct and it's true. I believe the Catholic Church is, in fact the proper historical and theological inheritor of what Jesus of Nazareth and those closest to him and those closest to them taught and believed as that has properly theologically developed over time. I'm a Catholic because I do believe and assent to the doctrine, the dogma of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, that Holy Communion is a deep mystery. Uh, God is mysterious. God is quite unlike what I envisioned him to be for much of my life. And he's still quite unlike what I envision him to be now because I can't envision God. But there is something deeply meaningful to me that 
this God, eternal, outside space, time, all powerful, all knowing, not good, but good itself, not beautiful, but beauty itself, not true, but truth itself, uh, became incarnate of the Virgin Mary to rescue this broken, ugly thing called human nature and descended to sort of permitted himself to undergo this in order to rescue human nature. And that in communion, there's something awful in the in the broad sense of that word, something awful about uh, Jesus being truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And that's, that's very vague and mysterious. Um, but it has made me better. It's opened me up to the reality of how sinful we are. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that or think that sometimes the Catholic church is too, too harsh. The Catholic church is at once the harshest and most merciful institution I know of. Confession is uh, an absolute beautiful thing, and I love it to death. I think um, the the sacramental life and the life of liturgical prayer and penance have drawn me closer to God than I was before and opened up a vista of God I didn't know before. And I would say, in particular, if I had one little message, if there are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who are on the fence about their faith in the LDS Church or who are thinking about going somewhere else or feel that pain and confusion that happens, I would say take some time as you heal through that difficult process and be open to the idea, the very strange idea that will strike you as very strange, that there might be something to Roman Catholicism. I'm not the Catholic Church's best ambassador or its most articulate defender by any stretch of the imagination. But I would invite them to discover what I discovered, which is there's there's something there there. And you ought to, at bare minimum, engage with that tradition before making up your mind about where you go. I think that's a great, a great message to get out there because I want people to hear all these different voices. Yeah. And- this is where the journey's led you. I've had atheists on. I've had a lot of, a lot of ex-Mormons I have had on are atheists or agnostic. Um, and so I think it's important to hear a story of somebody who has left the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but has found a place uh, that you feel has brought you closer to God. And really, that's what we want to strive to do, is to be closer to God through Indeed. his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Um, I think this was a really good conversation today, Jeremy. Yeah, I had a great time. I really appreciate you going out on a limb and having me on, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, now, now I'm going to be now I'm bringing these Catholics in, and oh no, what's going on, Steve? I thought you were an evangelical. Well, yeah, I'm all, I, I'm 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 a lot of things, and I will say, I guess in one sense, I technically am a Catholic as well. And so I always I always kind of forget about that. But yeah, that's right. I was baptized into the Catholic Church as an infant. And that is a valid baptism, yes. uh, folks, just so you know. Um, some people are a little confused on that, but actually it is considered a valid baptism. Um, Jeremy, before I let you go, was there anything else you want to share with the audience today? Uh, uh, was there any uh, website you want people to check out? Any 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 places if they want information? Uh, of course, I'll leave a link for people to purchase. Yeah, it. I would say, you know, if if you um, are interested in the, in the uh, things that come into my brain and out my fingertips too fast. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at tradvat two. Uh, and I, yeah, you know, pick up a copy of the book, give it a read. Uh, it's available from Ignatius press directly. You can get it on Amazon. You can buy it at most major online book retailers. I I've yet to see a copy out in the wild. I don't know if that's a real thing. Um, but you can get it online pretty much anywhere. You can get it on Kindle as well. And, uh, I hope that, you know, it's, it's, it's a story and I hope that people can 
feel and understand its sincerity and that it, it's coming from a very sincere place. This is a very well-written book. I I plowed through this baby in no time. I thought it was fantastic. I just think you're, you're a very good writer. You uh, and, and so it was a real joy and a pleasure to read this book. And I, I just recommend it. I recommend it to everybody in my audience. So wherever, whatever perspective and persuasion you're coming from, if you want to thought, but there's some good stuff, like I said earlier, there's a good summation of a lot of the scholarship that's happened, which I thought was, was really good and very helpful is can serve as an introduction to modern Mormon historical scholarship uh, as well. And of course, folks, this was a fantastic episode. We really got deep in the weeds today, which I like to do when I have somebody who wants to go there, we're going to go there. And it was a real pleasure and honor, Jeremy, to have you on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Stephen. I appreciate it. Well, I just want to remind you that we'll have links in the description, folks, for what we talked about today. Um, I'd also want to hear your comments. What do you think? What do you think about this guy coming to Catholic? You know, that's, that's kind of a, quite a jump there. It's quite a story he told, folks. And I'm glad that you got a taste of it. And again, I recommend the book. I also want to remind you, folks, that if you want to support our channel financially, you can buy items on our mormonbookreviews.com merch store. Uh, also, for those of you who want to financially support the channel on Patreon and PayPal, there will be links there as well. And we are getting the podcast updated, folks. We've been releasing two episodes a day. So we're almost, Anthony's has got us almost all caught up. I've been focusing primarily on the YouTube part of it. But this is our best month. Uh, I think we're closing in on 12,000 downloads on the just the audio podcast this month. So we're really pleased with the performance of that aspect of our channel as well. The message is getting out there. And the message is, the most important thing is, remember, folks, all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.